This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and a very special welcome to Secretary Harvey, Secretary John Harvey, Secretary of Veterans and Defense Affairs. I had to gl glance at my notes. I had to glance at my notes because when you first were sworn in, it was Secretary of Veterans Affairs and Homeland Security. Correct. But as our viewers may or may not know, the governor working with the General Assembly very much so. reoriented matters, and so Homeland Security shifted over to the Secretary of Public Safety. Correct. And then the, the great emphasis on, on veterans here in Virginia Correct. really is the is the lead part of yours and, and then other, mother, other defense affairs. So uh, when someone asks you, Mr. Secretary, what is your, your job in this capacity? What, what do you tell them? I think the, the real quick version is that my job on behalf of the governor is do all I can to make Virginia the most veteran and military friendly state in the Union. Uh, we're going to be generating an awful lot of new veterans here as the armed services go through the downsizing that's coming up, a very significant one, over the next four years. Those veterans represent an immense pool of talent that we should and, and, and must use in Virginia to help out with our future uh, economic development. And as always for our veterans, we want to be sure we're doing all we can to help them on a path to employability and to a job. So the, the two portfolios, the veterans portfolio and the, and the defense affairs portfolio, are very, very linked because you can't have one strong without the other being strong. And they both uh, are, are necessary to ensure a strong Virginia into the future. So on the, the veterans part, um, thinking about their employment, mm -hmm. it seems like every time I see some figures that talk about unemployment in the country, if they then break out unemployment among veterans, it tends even to be higher than the population as a whole. Is, is that what you see? Elsewhere in the country, but in Virginia, we're actually doing better. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so Good. our veterans' unemployment is lower than the general population unemployment which is uh, really, from my perspective, it's a very good thing, and, and we want to be sure we keep that on track. Oh, that, that is good. I, I know that there have been some efforts even in the previous administration to try to, to, to work with corporations in Virginia to try to determine ways of, of indicating from your experience in the military how that translates then into right. working. Right, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's just incredibly important to our future here in Virginia. And what you're talking about is the uh, V3, the Virginia yes. Values Veterans Program. And the basis for that is, is that old story about if you give a man a fish, you feed him for one meal. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for his whole life. We're teaching companies how to employ veterans, how to reach them, why they should reach them, and not just for altruistic reasons because we want to help out veterans because it's the right thing to do, but because it's also good for their company's bottom line. Our veterans represent an incredible resource to them, a disciplined, talented, 
skilled workforce that any company would, uh, they're the kind of workers any company wants to have as part of the organization. So V3 prog the V3 program run by a wonderful program manager by the name of Andy Schwartz in our Department of Veteran Services focuses on reaching the companies, big, middle, and small, and helping them and convert their good intentions into real jobs for veterans. So it's an incredibly important program. It started uh, back in uh, 2012. We've been reworking it and trying to revitalize it because the challenge is going to grow. We have the fastest growing <coughs> veterans population in the nation here in the Old Dominion. Oh, so is that right? That's absolutely correct. Right. And in, in just two years, we'll have the fourth largest population of veterans in a population of around 8 million. So we've really, in Virginia, we've really got to pick up our game. And the governor's been pretty insistent that, you know, we got to get this moving and, and, and to meet this growing challenge for our veterans. And probably there's a significant number of those veterans who are not second career people in their 40s or 50s, but are younger veterans. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the, that's the fastest growing population is in those veterans who are coming out with four, six, eight, you know, ten years, not retirees, but veteran right. service. And how do we reach them, which is a whole other challenge. We could talk about that for a couple of hours. But how do you reach them, introduce them to transition programs that lead to uh, put them on the path to employability and land a job? So that's a big challenge. The V3 program works with companies. We have to have transition programs that work with individual veterans, bring them into the process, and then bring them together with the opportunities that, that do exist here in large numbers. Now, a generation ago, those would have been primarily male, but now probably a significant percentage would be females. Yeah, and within the, and within the veterans population, that's the fastest growing group. I mean, today in the armed forces, you have between 15 and 17 percent uh, female population, grown quite dramatically. And there, what's interesting, though, is this: what they're allowed to do in the armed forces has expanded significantly mm -hmm. over the last five years, last ten years. So they're coming out with all manner of skills that people may not be used to. So we have a new uh, group within these veterans with unique health needs as well that we have to be sure we're responding to. So the, the female veteran population is growing significantly, but they come out with terrific skills and uh, other issues that we need to be able to focus on. Do, do you find or do they find in the V3 program where some employers are concerned about the mental state of some of the veterans? And I'm sure that while that's yeah. bound to be a small percent, it may make some skittish. You know, I am really glad you brought that up because I think this is a, a, a very big issue that's going to get bigger. This narrative that has taken root in the media, that somehow the veteran is damaged by their experience, mm -hmm. that somehow we have a number of ticking time bombs all waiting to go off and, and cause harm to themselves or others. The, you know, we got to get the facts on the table. That's always the first yes. rule in this game. And the facts are that the enormous number of our veterans come out stronger for their service. They are not victims. They are volunteers who serve this nation they have grown in the service of that nation. They have gained skills in the service of that nation. They have gained discipline in the service of that nation. And they bring all that out with them when they come back and reenter society. I think they are, the vast majority of them are far stronger for their service and better prepared to contribute positively to society simply because of that service. You know, there's a small percentage of them that were engaged in direct combat. Now, don't, no one can pretend that being engaged in combat does not make you different. It does, necessarily, does not necessarily damage you. Uh, I was right. talking to General McChrystal about this, and who uh, you know was a leader uh, in a, our leader in Afghanistan, General Odierno, the chief of staff. And there's no doubt you come out different from combat, but you do not necessarily come out damaged. But there's this popular image coming up, I think, that uh, is taking root. And we really need to step forward with the facts and ma make sure the truth comes out about how well-adjusted so many of these veterans are, ready to come into our society, ready to work alongside us, make their homes with us, raise their families with us, and just be part of Virginia society. I've, I've had the privilege in recent years of being friends with some who are now deceased, but who were veterans and who went 
on shore in Normandy. Mm -hmm. And I know from those that I knew in this area that even that, what I would say must have been a horrible experience right. there, that they didn't come out damaged. They, they were very jovial and strong people and, and had good careers. Right. And, and, you know, I was just on the 6th of June, we had the 70th uh, anniversary of the D-Day invasion. So I was out at Bedford at the National mm. D-Day uh, Memorial at the marvelous service they had there with so many D-Day veterans who were there on right. Omaha Beach. And you know the story of Bedford and the yes. Bedford boys and the horrific casualties they took in the first two minutes of the invasion. But I was talking with one who was from Bedford, who was one of those Bedford mm. boys. He was 91 years old. He landed on the beach. He was the only survivor out of his platoon of 30 men who landed with him out of that landing craft. And certainly it was a profound impact. Right. It right. stayed with him for his whole life. And he spoke about that eloquently. But it didn't keep him from having a life. Yes. It didn't keep him from raising a family, being a productive member of the community. So I think we really need to get this story straight, and I'm, I'm very grateful to you for bringing it up. Well, I've, I've been personally concerned. It seems like that, uh, as some of us would like to say, maybe the 24-hour news cycle, where something has to be talked about all the time, and, and that it's uh, gotten more attention than it really deserves when you think of the number of people who have served right. in the military. And you know, there's this tendency, I think, uh, within our society, we look for victims, uh, and there are certainly there are many, many people who have had very difficult circumstances come their way for very bad reasons, perhaps. But your average veteran is not a victim of anything. He is a volunteer, and she is proud to have served, and she comes back from that service, I think, a, a much stronger person than when she went in. You know, the, the news has focused in some degree around the country, not so much here in Virginia that I've heard, but on the health care provided in, in the hospitals. Right. Uh, what, what's sort of your perspective on that as you've seen here in the Commonwealth and beyond, if you wish? Yeah, we have three big veterans hospitals here in the Commonwealth, and that's uh, Salem out in Roanoke, uh, McGuire right here in, in Richmond, and then the Hampton VA Hospital down in Hampton, Virginia. The Washington, D.C. Veterans Hospital serves a great number of veterans from the Northern Virginia area, but it's not in the Commonwealth. Uh, Clearly, the data just came out last week, I believe, about wait times for appointments. And, and, and there were several of the hospitals had some very significantly long wait times. Uh, that's always a matter of concern because if, if you're just going in there for some kind of a routine check, like, for instance, I get a routine dermatology check. And so it's, it's not something that's life or death or, or in, in that way. But it, it could be something that has a significant impact, impact on that health care immediately for, for that veteran. So which ones are being delayed? I think that's the key. We, we don't know the full scope of the problem. So Secretary Hazel, our Secretary of Health and Human Services, and I are going to go visit in the next two weeks all of our hospitals in the, in the, in the state. And the governor said, go out there, talk with the directors, and see what we can do to help out in the areas where they're falling short in, in getting the appointments on time. As you know, these hospitals are located in the middle of tremendous regional uh, medical capabilities. I mean, Virginia, we got some of the best in the country. So how do we come together at this time of crisis and say, here's what we can do in the Commonwealth to help you out. Which areas do you need this help on and how do we make that happen in an effective uh, manner for our veterans in Virginia? So that's what we're going to do. And it's a larger issue your question. Uh, there's so many issues that are now coming out. And getting to ground truth, I think, is the most important step right now. What are the medical outcomes that we're seeing that we don't like in the veterans' hospitals? Quality care, you can get, you can get all kinds of statements about the quality of care at these hospitals you know, across the spectrum. Uh, what about claims processing? because we're going to have the fastest growing veterans population. We've got to be sure our Virginia veterans are being dealt with fairly and expeditiously by a very, very bureaucratic process. Believe me, it is bureaucratic. It defines the term. So how do we help through our Department of Veterans Services, DVS, how do we help our veterans engage in that process and get their claims uh, properly adjudicated in a timely manner? So we've got lots we can do and lots we will do to try to help out while this crisis is going on. 
I'm glad you mentioned the dermatology one <laughs> because uh, I, have, I have thought and I haven't seen that much attention given to it in the national media that there are certainly very serious matters that should get attention very quickly and other matters that are routine that whether one is veteran or civilian that oftentimes can take a few months right. to, to get so, it. I mean, so when, we, I, when I see my dermatologist, right. uh, I know that unless I set the next appointment when I'm there that time, that if I call and change it, I'm going to be looking at a two-month exactly. extension. So, so let's figure out what's really important, what's mm -hmm. critical, focus on that, and not get caught up in, in, in there's this arbitrary, uh, I think they said, a 14-day limit. Well, that just led to all kinds of bad behavior. Right. You know, a bad metric leads to very bad behavior in trying to meet that metric. And I think that's a big piece of, of what we found out here. Before we move over to defense matters, uh, anything else about the veterans you'd want to say? You've covered some really important subjects. No, well, I think uh, one thing that, that's really terrific here in the Old Dominion is that this is a very uh, bipartisan portfolio. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's the Veterans Caucus and the General Assembly, uh, the response you get, no matter who you talk to in the, in the state senate or in the House of Delegates uh, or in, uh, certainly in, in, our, in our administration, uh, you get a very, very positive response about let's do the right thing, but let's make sure we're doing uh, uh, enough of the right thing to, to meet the demands of today. And I personally have been just so gratified because you do get such a positive response wherever you go in this state. Uh, whether dealing with civic groups, local government, uh, you know, the legislature, and certainly the governor is all in on, on, on t making sure we're doing right by the veterans. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have that portfolio where so many people find the, the common ground that the governor talks about. So many people are able to find that common ground, come together, and let's do the right thing. Well, that, that certainly is, is good commendation for the legislators as well as certainly the governor and, and former governors who've been very strong supporters Absolutely. too, so that, that's superb. On the defense matters, of course, our viewers may not know that you served, you were admiral in, right. the, Na in the Navy. So yeah, up until you, the fall of 2012, I was on active duty with our Navy, yeah. and I was in command of uh, what's called Fleet Forces Command. People may be more familiar with the term, the Atlantic Fleet mm -hmm. uh, down in Norfolk at the time I retired. So as, we look, as you look at defense matters in Virginia, um, Virginia is very fortunate uh, to have some some great defense, uh, but, but whether it's I mean in, whether it's Navy or whether it's oh, Army, yes. but I mean have facilities right. here in Virginia. We have we have crown jewels from every one of the services, including the Coast Guard, here in the Old Dominion. Whether it's the Marines, the crossroad of the Corps is at Quantico, a huge Marine footprint there. Fort Belvoir, Fort Myer, Fort Eustis. Uh, from the Army, Langley Air Force Base, one of the Air Force's oldest installations housing their newest aircraft and so much else, and of course the huge Navy footprint down in Hampton Roads and then all the services all around Northern Virginia. So it's a, so it's a tremendous uh, bonus for the state that, and it's a tribute to the state that so many of the services have chosen to invest so heavily here. Now it, it leads to a tough situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, down Hampton Road, somewhere between, for the last 30 years, 40 years, between 40 and 45 percent of the economic activity in Hampton Roads can be attributed to the defense footprint in Hampton Roads. So when the budget mm -hmm. starts to downturn across the board, then we benefited greatly from that defense budget over the past few years, many years. But now when it comes to a downturn, then we may be hit proportionally harder by that downturn than other states. So what do we have to do to ensure that we, we uh, maintain uh, a, a, st a status with these installations so that they know the state is doing everything we can, working with the local communities to maintain uh, their ability to stay here and thrive here, and that their sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen say this is the place where we want to be stationed. We want to raise our families here. So we want the Virginia to be a military friendly state as well as a veterans friendly state. And that takes a lot of work, but that's work that needs to get done. I'm sure that's continual, constant work uh, because these are great assets and it's a matter of protecting the assets, which uh, 
on, on other matters, uh, governor and, and others in economic development, they're looking to get companies or corporations to move to Virginia. In these instances, it's really looking to preserve those assets. Right. And this is a preservation, but I'm very encouraged because even this very difficult budget cycle that's going on right now, the, you can look at the military investments, what's called the military construction budget. They have, Virginia is the only gaining state virtually in the union where there's a lot more new projects being developed. So they still see the value, but you're absolutely right. We need to preserve what we have as well and make sure we're taking all the steps necessary to, to give them reasons to stay as well as reasons to invest. So in, in your role then, you're working in that instance with more with our representatives in Congress and our senators and, and with I guess with your contacts and your folks that you've yeah, worked with? Yeah, I think with. The, the governor's expectation is that I'm on this 24-7 in Washington with the services, working with communities like, you know, Hampton or Virginia Beach and Chesapeake, uh, you know, up here in Richmond with uh, the great complex at Fort Lee that means so much to the local area there. So I think the expectation is that I'm doing everything I can do to make sure we're sending the right message and doing the right things to keep our installations here in Virginia. Yeah, strong shoulders and a lot of weight been put on you. Well, to, that's okay. To, to I, do I that. still got gas in the tank, so <laughs> I, can, I can get it done. Before we were starting the show, I was saying we could have said welcome back to Virginia right. because you've been somewhat on loan, as I think a reference was made. To tell our viewers what you were doing during that time. When yes, you were uh, early on, just right after I got uh, sworn in uh, early February and thinking about all the things we need to get going and get doing and getting organized. Uh, I got a call from uh, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Hagel, who asked me to be the co-chairman of an uh, independent review of the nation's uh, nuclear forces, the forces that uh, control and potentially use uh, nuclear weapons, sort of the foundation of our national security policy. Uh, you may recall, and some of the viewers may recall, some very untoward news stories about significant deficiencies that had come up. Uh, whether it was in the Air Force, a cheating scandal down in the Navy at the nuclear training uh, facility down there. And the Secretary Hagel, obviously and, and rightly, very, very concerned and wanted to get a, an independent set of eyes across the board on, on the nuclear forces and come back and tell him what we recommend he should do in response to what we found. So it was very, very busy. From March 3rd through June 3rd, we visited every bomber base, every missile base, every submarine base, and all the supporting uh, commands, uh, talked with Air Force and Navy leadership, went and visited the NATO commands and the uh, units in Europe, in Belgium, in Germany, in Italy, that, uh, where we have stored uh, nuclear weapons in support of NATO. It was a, it was a real, real uh, rushed, very, very busy whirlwind tour, and uh, let's take a look talk to the airmen, sailors, marines who are so deeply involved in this, talk to their leadership, and then sort through it all and come back and uh, we, we're done. We've completed our report and we sit down with the Secretary of Defense on the 1st of July and, and uh, my co-chair, General Larry Welsh, retired former Chief of Staff of the Air Force and uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Strategic Air Command, will have that powerful conversation with the Secretary about what we think he should do. Well, as, as a Virginian, I uh, must say that we're certainly proud to have you in the Commonwealth and doing that work and, and that you were called on to help on this very important national issue, too. Yeah, as a, as, a, as a citizen, I was very glad to have done this. I think it was important work. I didn't know what I was going to find, but I, I think it was very important to do this. As a cabinet member for the governor, I was sitting there going, gosh, there's, there's a lot of things I need to be doing for for my job, for Virginia, for our veterans, and, and uh, so I was torn a little bit, but uh, now I'm back full bore on, on my portfolio and supporting the governor and, and, uh, and what he wants to do for the state, and, and uh, it's a great program, and I'm, I'm just very proud, very proud to be able to serve some more for the state and for the country. Well, Mr. Secretary, we really appreciate this, and we want to tell our viewers as we close that they can go to your website, they can go to the department's website. They need to 
whatever size company or corporation they have, right. they need to look at the P3. V3. V, the V3. Virginia the, Values Veterans, the V3 program. V3 initiative. Right. And Incredibly because, important. Because there's an opportunity for them of any size to be involved. Absolutely. So and it's the right thing to do. Thank you very much, and we look forward to having another conversation with I you. I look forward to it as well. You've given me a great opportunity, and I truly appreciate it. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.